Hi, uh, JavaScript developers. Uh, this week we're going to be learning about events. We're going to be able to create events, handle events, and um, just kind of get an understanding of how the JavaScript event loop works, you know, to allow us to allow users and even the browser to generate events, stack them up, and then handle them in code. So we're going to do this with the browser game, and this is a tic-tac-toe game. So let me start the fork on this. And while that's going on, I'll show you. This is with, when you're on SU Web Dev, and you just browse the unfinished game. This is what you'll see. So you'll see it looks like a tic-tac-toe board. There's some hover activity going on. There are buttons, but they don't work. The tiles don't do anything. We just kind of have a design on each tile. Um, and this is where we're starting. Um, and let's take a look at after it's coded. So let me go to, this is my, my, code, my coded example. In this case, still have this hover. These don't work, but when I click Start Game, I change to this question mark and then I indicate that it's X's move. So I've chosen, actually for me, X's and O's as my tokens, but I'll show you how you can, how that, you can choose uh, any tokens you want. So then once that's set up, I, I, I move X, and now it changes to say O's move. So I move O, X, O, and I'm gonna let X win here. And then I get an, an indicator that X won, and I say play again. And let's do try and do a game where nobody wins. So sometimes it's hard to make it fail. There are no moves. So that's a draw. And then I get an option to play again. So that's what we're heading for. And um, let's see if I can go here. And we so we fork this. I've got my copy browser game. And let's go ahead and do SSH clone. And see. So I'm in 3020, so get clone. And I'll clone that browser there. And we'll open that with code. OK. So that will get our code loaded up. Before we look at the code, though, I just want to look at some diagrams I have to give you some visualization about what's going to happen here. So first of all, this is just general, not specific to this program, but we have this JavaScript event loop. And this is how you can picture what's going on when, when these event emitters are like buttons or forms where, where users can make changes or click, and that emits an event. The browser also can emit events, like when it's loaded content, it will emit an event. And these events just get queued up, called the event queue, and there's this loop that just runs continuously, listening for events. And when it gets an event, it pulls it off of the, the, you know, the first one in, gets to be the first one out. And that event gets handled. And a, an event handler is usually just a function with some instructions on what to do when that event happens. And often it changes state. And we know state is, is really kind of like data or this, the condition of the web page at a, at a given moment in time. So that's kind of what's happening in the flow. And there's some definitions down here, too, for these, these uh, terms. Now, in our specific case, uh, I pulled out some of the buttons that I'm using and, on, and some of the events we'll be looking at. Um, you'll see DOM content loaded, and that's a browser event that tells us that all of our um, all of the items are rendered on the page. So we're going to be attaching event listeners to various objects like buttons. And we have to make sure that button is rendered before we try to do that. So we wait for this DOM content loaded. And for any of you that are familiar with jQuery, it's, it's kind of the jQuery ready um, function is similar to detecting the DOM content loaded. And then this listen is always, it's kind of like um, when you set up a listener on an object. That listener, you can think of it running in a continuous loop, just waiting for that event to happen. When it gets a signal, when the event is triggered, then it will call a function. So we'll be calling a function when you, you know, we'll be listening for a start game event, 
on and calling a function. Um, there's a tile, what it looks like before the game is started, and those don't do anything. There's no listener on those tiles. But on these question mark tiles, there's a listener. That's after the game is started. And it says, um, you know, in instantiate tic-tac-toe start. And then we have the X. Um, so these are when a live token, the game is started. You click on that. And we have a handle move. And then we're going to create our own events. So you can create events. They're really just strings. And you can fire them off in your code. So we're going to create a win event and a draw event. And there will be a listener for that in our code. And that will show the win screen or the draw screen, that kind of pop-up that we saw. And then um, when there's no more moves, there, there was a button there to play again. And we'll be listening for that. And in fact, that isn't a handler so much. That's just going to end up being an anchor tag. So we click on that. It says, OK, go back home. So those are kind of the events that we're going to be handling. And we'll be writing a fair amount of code in this exercise. So um, let's get started on that. All right, so if we take a look at this code now, uh, let's start with the index.html. If you look, you can see that there is some Bootstrap used in this. Um, and Bootstrap will make this responsive so that you can run it on a phone. It's loaded using a CDN. And I've loaded all the particulars so that you can have the all the full Bootstrap in here. Um, and um, I'm using CDN. If you want, you can download this and hook to it you know, directly from your own file system. But I, I kind of like to use the CDN and you know, just rely on that. However, I did, I did download the, the non-minified. You, know, you can see we're using minified code here. So that's the most efficient for, for um, production. But I've downloaded the non-minified because in the index.html, you are going to find references to a lot of um, a lot of different uh, classes, some of which are defined for you in the in the main CSS, um, but not all of them. So, for instance, this LED, LEAD, um, you won't find it in main, but you will find it in Bootstrap. So this is just to give you um, some information if you're trying to track down what's creating the various styles, you know, if you want to modify them. And you'll see that we're going to be doing some of that in code. So I want you to be able to understand where all the pieces come from. And then you'll see here that we have this FAS, FAS heart. And so that can come in through a span, or you can bring it in through an I tag. And those refer to the font awesome icons, which I think you have some familiarity with. And you can look for font. You're, it's up to you what icons you use. You know, of course, you want to be consistent. There's going to be a player one and a player two. There's going to be a non-played tile. So you know, think through that. But you can, you can choose your own icons. And it's just as simple as going out to the Font Awesome site and searching for icons. Um, so you know, I think I use times for an X. But obviously, you don't have to be limited to my choices. But when you choose one out here, you'll see that you get an I tag with the classes needed. And then the FAS, so the FA times really specifies the, the actual icon. And the FAS is just an indication that this is one of the free ones, which is probably what you want to use. So that, that explains what's going on here. And then you can see that we have you know, this kind of grid here, just to look at what's going on. We have a row with a call 3 and a, then a call 9. So that gives us some layout. Um, and we have some information about starting the game. And then we have a, a sort of grid created out of, um, out of the bootstrap grid system using rows and columns um, to create the game board. Then we have a win screen and a draw screen. And these are just those kind of pop-up screens you saw when the game either ended due to a win or a draw. So those are kind of the, the structure of the HTML. All right, um, so when we're looking at code, when I have a lot of code or a lot of sections, I like to use the folding um, ability of in uh, this Visual Studio Code. And to do that, I, I hover over this margin, and I see these minuses. And when you click on them, they become pluses. So you can fold and unfold. 
And with a shift click, you can fold everything up and then you can unfold it. It sort of recursively folds it. And this can help you to really get a, a look at the structure of a page. So you can see that the main structure um, has this title and then it has this row. And in the row, we've got two columns, one ID game board. And in game board, we have the three rows in each row, three columns. So shift click can fold everything up and make it easier to look at the structure of something like this. As we go to the code, we, we can also use that. So shift click, I can fold recursively up all these sections. And this can help me to analyze what I need to do in the code a lot better. So um, let's unfold a few things here. We have a to-do here where we're going to create a player class. We have a class called Tic-Tac-Toe, and we're going to have some to-dos in there. And um, we have a number of to-dos in there, actually. And then down here, we have a handle move, which is an external function written for us. So this one will be um, used, if you remember back in my analysis here, that handle move is listening for when I click on a live tile. And that's written to record the move, Passing. So remember, a handle move will be an event handler. All event handlers receive an event object. And we'll pass that on to the record move, which will update the game board, check for winner, and switch player. And that's written for us. But meanwhile, we have this tic-tac-toe class, which we're going to be doing a lot of work in there. And then we have this handle move function, which we don't have to do anything. So how to address this? I can just go in order as it's laid out, but I think what I want to do is to be somewhat strategic about it, or I might just get lost in all of the things going on. So let's look at how we're going to do that. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to Follow some of these to-dos, setting up a global game variable, setting up a player class, and then I'm going to begin in this constructor for the tic-tac-toe class to um, set up all of these properties. Um, then we'll examine game state and win state. After that, I think I'm going to go right, I'm going to jump down and do the start board because that'll give us a clue as to how this board is constructed and reconstructed uh, after each game or when you click on start game. So let's start in here. The first thing is that we want to declare a variable named game and we're going to make it, we're going to use let and this is going to end up being a reference to the tic-tac-toe, an instance of the tic-tac-toe object. But right now I'm just declaring it and it's going to be global to this whole, to all of the classes and functions in this page because I'm setting it up here at the top. I'm using let because I'm going to be reassigning instances so I can't use const. And that just kind of sets up a global variable for creating, for a, referencing a, an instance of the game object. The next thing that I'm going to do is uh, set up the player class. And this is uh, going to have a constructor that will define and initialize two, um, two players. <clears throat> and it will get initialized with a token. And you'll see that the token will be a string that maps to a, um, a font awesome icon. So let's just say that when we create a new player, we pass in a token, and then we assign that token to this dot token, which makes it a property of the player class. And just to remind you, the these this is what this is going to this FASFA part of the Font Awesome class is going to be precede every um, icon. But for the tokens, we can just use these strings, and then by uh, creating maybe a um, an interpolated string with the FAFS constant and the heart being a variable we can 
uh, assign that class to change the look of, of a div, one of these divs in our code. And you're going to see how that works. So the first thing is we, we give each player, we set up a game, we, get, we create a player class, and then we're going to go into our tic-tac-toe class. And we're given instructions here um, to uh, set up a bunch of um, properties. And these properties are going to be used to track the progress. And we're going to be assigning some of them to null or zero, depending on if they're an object or a, a, a number. And then we'll also be setting some properties to some element, picking up some elements using query selector. So to get this going, um, we're going to start with this dot current player current player equals null. And these to dos are pretty good um, instructions on what you're supposed to do. And you want to use the same name that is given. And you can kind of check that you did that right by clicking on it and making sure you didn't create a typo there. So um, let's just do a few more of these. And then I'm going to do them very quickly so that you don't have to watch me type all this. So winner equals null. I'll get down to where I'm doing one of the using one of the query selectors. So that's winner. And you can check that. And let's see. This dot move count equals zero. So that's going to be a number. And then we're going to start setting up these DOM elements. So this is going to use query selector. So this dot start prompt equals document dot query selector. And we'll use the hash start. Let's use the single quotes, hash start prompt. OK. And then you can see we have a whole bunch of these to do. And I'm going to just uh, stop it and do it very quickly so you don't have to watch me type. All right, so you can see I've added all of these. And let's just double check them. We'll just click on there. And one of the things to notice about the naming here, and um, this is kind of something you'll see as you go through um, getting into writing components in a framework is there's the names in code are using camel case and um, Looks like I have an error there the names in code use camel case and the names in the HTML use dashes so that kebab casing and so they can they they call this conversion between kebab and camel case normalization, at least in Angular, one of the frameworks that's really popular, kind of started that convention. And so that's a good naming strategy is to, if you're going to name something, you know, with multiple words to use camel case in code, and then if you want to convert that to something that you might use in HTML um, or CSS, then take out the capital and just use a dash. So it looks like we've got all of that set up. And those are our base um, tic-tac-toe. Those are our, our base properties. And that's what constitutes the state of the game. So these, these are data items. When we instantiate the tic-tac-toe, these are going to get data in them. And that constitutes the state of the game, which will change over the course of the game. And there's a couple of variables that are defined for you here, game state. And this is um, the actual tokens that are assigned in each value. So this maps to the three rows of the tic-tac-toe board and the three columns. And so if I put a star in 0, 0, it's going to register that in the game state here as a star. And so this keeps track of where the tokens are placed on the board during the game. And then win states, this is actually a list that was created for you that shows all of the possible ways that something can win. So and this shows like, uh, this is like a, uh, actually like a multi-dimensional array. So we have this array, and then for and then we have a, an array for a given win, and then for each win we have the x and y values. So if we take, if we have a 
token at 0, 0, 0, and then the same token at 0, 1, and 0, 2, that would be like all of the top row, that would be a win. And so as we're playing and we're at each move we're checking to see who won, we can compare the game state to all of these win states. And you'll see the code for that because most of that's provided. Okay, so we're still in the, um, let me see if I can format this and see how that looks. We're still in the tic-tac-toe, and you can see there's a lot of functions to find. Some of these are sort of helper functions, check for winter, winner. Some of these are handlers, and you can usually tell it's a handler if it's accepting an event. Um, before I get into that, I want to go down to this and work on the setup board, because I think this will help understand us understand kind of how we get that board going each time. You know, it starts out and it's just some random, whatever we choose, um, alternating icons. And then when we get it going, they become question marks. Uh, so let's see how that happens. And, and you can see that this is going to uh, clear all the content from this game board. And then we're going to actually have a, a nested loop, a nested for loop that creates all of the rows and within each row all of the columns. So this kind of code can get messy and we'll just try our best to uh, keep it straight. But you're going to see how you can uh, build up a, um, a bunch of HTML, you know, an HTML structure, um, a hierarchical structure, and then append it to, to your existing HTML. And so Let's take a look at how this works. So first of all, we're going to clear that game board. So we have this um, game board, and we're just going to set inner HTML equal to empty string. So that, that actually just clears it out. And if you were stepping through this code and looked at the view, you would see that the game board went away there. Then we're going to come down here, and we're going to create a for loop with an iterator i. So let i equal 0, i less than 3, i plus plus. So we have our standard looping uh, constants here, or, or variables, we, we are structures. We have our initialization, test for complete, and increment. And those are going to be, you're going to see those in all loops. Now we do have a little bit of help here since we're doing nested loop and we have a really lot of code. You can see that here's a note that your first loop should end here. So first loop is our outer loop. So we're just going to have this line up with, with that. And so if I format, I can see that it's nicely closed. So that's really helpful. And then when we're in this loop, the first thing that we're going to do is create a new row called new row. And it's going to be a document create element. So this creates a, an element that's right now just in memory. And we're going to set a class on that using set attribute. And the set attribute uses, um, you have a, the name of the attribute. So the, the attributes, remember, are those uh, quoted values that are set with equal sign. So class equals row. And row, again, we're using bootstrap. And row um, is how we set up you know, the bootstrap row class so that we can have that um, responsive uh, layout. Um, and now we're going to do the inner loop. And we're going to use, instead of i, we'll use the next j for, for this iterator. But once again, we got three columns, so we're going to iterate three times. 0, 1, 2, and, not, and that will get us three iterations. And again, we open this up, but we have a little note that we can close. The second loop can close here. OK, so that gives us, let's see, yes. So there's the second loop. So we've set up a nested for loop, and it's three by three. We've got a div with a row in it. And if you look, we're, we're just kind of matching what we have here. And now we're going to be creating these, um, these uh, rows and columns. So we create a new column. 
So let new call. You can see how naming helps. It helps you kind of keep track of what you're doing here. Create element. Uh, div. And then we're going to set let we're going to say new call um, dot set attribute and again it's going to be a class and the class will be call xs xs3 and remember that saying that we we, we can have um, at the extra small size, we go to three across. Okay. And then the next thing we want to do is we're inside that, inside that div, we're going to create a span tag and that's where we'll put the icon. So icons can show up in span tags or I tags, you know, I tags were originally for italics and then they became like new voice. Anyway, they kind of make sense for icons because they're an I, but but you'll see icons show up in span tags or I tags. So let's just say let new tile equal and we'll say document create element new tile and we actually want to call it actually no we want to create a span tag sorry span tag that will be called new tile and then we're going to add our uh, our class to that span tag and new tile dot set attribute um, and it'll be class and we'll do fast dot fast fa dash question because we're this is setting up a new uh, board that will be active but no one will have moved yet and we'll give it the tile class okay and now we are ready to, so we've got a tile to go into this span tag. Um, and now we want to set some data on this. So let's just take a quick look at the docs on setting data. Because you, set, you can set data attributes on HTML and then you can retrieve that data later in code. But let's just take a look at the docs on that really quick. So I've jumped over to Google and found using data attributes in MDN. So what the way that data works is if you just create an attribute with a data dash, it will, and then you put the name of the data in as after the dash. So here we have index number columns. Um, you can then get that data later on, and the way you get it is by uh, looking at the data set and then whatever name you got it. And you can see here they normalize that index number name. So that's, you can see that example in code. So if you grab an object that has a, a data attribute, you can pull that data out. And so what we're gonna do is put some data into our objects. So let's go back to the code and here we are. We're told to set up a data x attribute on the new tile equal to i. So this will give us the positioning of the x and y within our tic-tac-toe grid. So to do that, we just say new tile set attribute data, actually data x, and then i. And then we'll set so that would be like the row value and then the new tile dot set attribute data y and that will be j. So because this is just we're iterating across the row and then and then within the row down the column. So the j is the column and the i is the row. Um, so the next thing we want to do is to start appending these this these things to our 
to our actual HTML. So first of all, we'll, we'll attach the tile to the column. So we'll say new call.append child new tile. So that appends new tile to new call. And then we'll append the column to the row. So we'll say new row dot append child new call. Okay. And then, so now we've got the the row, depending the rows to the child, and and there's so appending the columns to the rows. And that ends our inner loop. Then after we filled out a whole row and we're in the outer loop, we will append the row to the game board. So this, remember this dot game board, this is um, part of the data in our in our property in our game um, board dot append child. new row. So we've created, we've appended the icon to the column, the column to the row, and now the row to the game board. Okay, actually this kind of following what we've been doing, go down here, and then we close that out. So now we have set up a game board. Um, the next thing that we need to do is to call the setup child listeners. And so this is a function that's kind of a helper function here. So rather than just having all of this in one giant function, we have a helper function to set up these listeners. And this is where we're setting up listeners on each, a click event basically um, on each of these tile elements. But we'll just make that call here, this.setup child, let's see, setup tile listeners. Okay, so I think that it would be a good idea at this point to go just set those up. Um, and because this is kind of where, where we're leaving off. So let's go find this by just shift click, takes me up to this child listeners. And you can see this is not really a linear process. When you're dealing with events, events don't happen in a sequence. So it helps to have, be able to move around your code to where you where the where your thinking is. So we're going to set up these child listeners or these tile listeners and what it's telling us is that we need to select all the tile elements into a variable called tile elements. So we'll just do a local variable tile elements equal document query selector. And in this case we want them all, so we'll just use the query selector all. We'll get a, an array out of that and we'll just use the tile class to select. And then we're told to create a loop that just adds a click event listener to each tile. So we can actually use our for of to do this rather than counting. You could count, but for of is actually kind of cleaner code. So tile elements. So we're gonna iterate through all of these elements that we picked up in our hand, in our DOM that we've just added from creating the game board and we're going to add event listeners and we're the list we're going to have it listen on a click this is a predefined event that is in the browser um, and when you when you get that click we're going to call handle move and this happens to be um, a global uh, function that, that remember we that's defined for us. So let's just go double look at that again. And so that's just a shift click on that name takes us down here to handle move, and it's defined for us. And it's going to call record move, check for winner, and switch player. So why don't we next try doing this record move and see see what? Because that's kind of the next step. If you clicked on a tile, you would trigger an event. The event would be sent to handle move, and then we would click, we would go uh, to record move. Let's see. I wasn't able to get there, but
But record move, we're still in this tic-tac-toe. This is that really large class. And record move is a handler defined in there. So this move handles a move in the game state in the game state property. So to room to uh, see. Uh, hang on a second. So we're going to just follow these instructions. Um, find the XY coordinates of the tile selected, and we'll be able to pull that out of the event, and then claim that the claim that the tile is in the, this dot game state array. Set the class attribute to the tile to reflect the player. So if someone has clicked on a X, on a question mark. We are going to um, record that, and then we're going to um, we're going to get the x and y variables, and we're going to check the game state, and then we're going to um, you know a move could sig signal the end of the game or a draw, and we, we want to determine that. So let's start out just following along here. Let title x let Create a variable called tile x equal event dot target dot data set. So this is how we can pull data. So we, we, we had an event that occurred by clicking on one of these objects, one of these tiles. So we get all the information from that DOM element. And because we put data x in there, we can pull it out by going to the target of this event, looking at its data set and pulling the x value. So this is pretty cool. We're going to get data out of the DOM. We put it in there and now we can recover it. So tile y equals event dot target dot data set dot y. Okay, and then, oops, and then the next thing that we want to do is claim this spot for the player. So we're going to do this if, and this is, I think, part of a stretch, but I think the idea that I've got is that if this hasn't already been claimed, then I'm going to allow you to claim it. Otherwise, I'm not going to do anything. And really, that's kind of an error state, but I'm going to keep you from being able to claim something that's already been claimed. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to test this dot game state tile tile x tile x tile y. So I'm saying if if no one had if if this member game state is set up with nulls, so if I do a not on this. I'm saying if if that hasn't been set to anything beyond null, then that it will return true. So that if I if it's open for use, that will return true. Then I am going to get set that event target set attribute. So I'm still on the same you know you know div there that that did that got the click. And I'm going to say class uh, tile and then it's played. So I'm setting the classes here. So it's a tile. It's been played. So there are certain, you know, if you look in main CSS uh, styles associated with played, FAS, FA dash, and then, oh, this is going to be interpolated too because I'm going to use a variable in here. So this is interpolated, and my variable. So I'm going to interpolate in here so that it puts my current player token. So this dot current player dot token. All right, so this this is going to set change that question mark to a, a style that has the icon of the current player and then these tile and played 
so that and so this is this is kind of important you know that you get this that you understand how this uh, list of classes is going to work so that is what you get to do um, if let's see this dot if this oh I didn't finish this if this dot game state yes then I will oh first of all I'm I left this out we need to say this dot game state we need to set this game state tile x tile y equals this dot current player dot token so what are we doing there so in this case we're setting that array called game state this the, the position in the array game state it's that nested array up here we're going to set that position to the token of the person that just clicked on the tile and then we're going to set the class for that tile so this one just changes the state inside of our program whereas this one will actually change the way that the HTML looks that the page the web page looks uh, and then following through with the idea that I'm only going to let them set something that hasn't already been set I'm going to return false so I'm not going to do anything so if you return false on a handler um, it basically stops the event it's done and nothing and I'm not going to do anything and I encourage you to look at this particular bit of code and see, you know, are there issues with just returning false? Should I, should I say there's an error? Should I alert that there's an error? But I'll leave that to you. But anyway, we've, we've taken care of claiming the game state. We got the XY coordinates. We claim the game state. So we, in, the, in the program, we've changed the state of the program. And we've also changed the view. And the view really is part of the state as well. Um, the next thing that we, so you can see that this to-do goes right up here. Okay. So have a look at that. That's the record event. We've taken care of all three of those items. Okay. So what to work on next? We've done set up board. We've uh, done the hand we've looked at the handler and we've done the record move let's do check for winner so in check for winter winner i am going to see that a lot of code's been written for me here so we have this code that is doing the iteration to compare the game state with the win winning states and I encourage you to look at this I'm not going to do it right now but you can go through that with a debugger and see how it is iterating through comparing what your what your game board is to what would be a win and so at, at when you're done with this you're either going to have winning condition true or false and if it's a win we're going to do some some code here um, so what we're going to do is we're going to actually create our own uh, internal event called win. An event is really just, a, you just name it with a string. So we're going to create a win event. And it's going to be new event. And an event is a JavaScript class that you can use. And you pass in a name for the string. And that will be the string. Like we handled the click string, we're going to, someone's going to handle this win string string um, and then we so let's see okay we're creating a new event I'll just put this here and then we're going to dispatch it so this is how we fire off the event internally so we don't have a user doing this we have the code creating this event dispatch event and we're going to dispatch the the object that is def is was instantiated with new event win and then we're going to return true and true or false it will stop that processing so because one of the things that we're looking for is winning condition 
um, if we set it to true, um, it will stop the additional move count check. So um, that that is a win, and then it will fire an event, and we'll see in a little bit the code that handles that event. The next thing we do is we are going to create a draw event, and this will be similar. So if if the check here determines that there's no more moves to be made and nobody's win the one, then we'll call it a draw and we will do the draw event, new event draw. And then we'll dispatch that. So we'll say document dispatch event draw event. Okay, so that looks good. And so now we completed check for winner. And the next thing that we want to do is switch player. So let's go to switch player. And this will take care of handling, handling um, our setup for the, well, let's take a look at this again. I need to be refreshed. So the handle move that takes this is all taking care of us clicking on a tile. So we've recorded the tile, we've tested for a win, and now the other thing that happens is that the other player get, gets made into current player. So let's take a look at that. And so the to do is to make a conditional check to see if the current player is equal to player one. So this is kind of we're setting up a toggle. Otherwise, it's going to set it to type uh, player two. So it's this this dot current player equals equals this dot player one. Then this this dot current player equals this dot player player two. Okay? So that, that just toggles us between or oh, and then the else this else this dot current player equals this dot player one. So this is a kind of standard toggle if you're you know if you're this change to the other otherwise change to the first other. So we're either going to end up, if we were one, we're going to be two. If we were two, we're going to be one. So we set that up. And then um, we need to change the class on the current player token. That's that one that's off to the left that shows whose move it is. And so this dot current player token set attribute class and we're going to use again our icon fa. Well, let's do we need to do a, a tick and fas fa dollar this dot current player token. Okay, so that gets you um, the current the correct uh, token set on the for the current player token div. All right, that gets us through all of the handle event. Now let's go back up and see what we're missing here in our code. So we, we've done the properties. We've got the check for winner done. You've got the record move, switch player, set up tile listeners, show wind screen. Okay, so we, now we want to do the show wind screen. And there'll be a comparable show draw screen, draw, show win screen, show the draw screen. So who's calling this? Just to remember, um, that is part of setting up what's called the outside of the class definitions. So maybe we should start with that, and then that'll get us into that. So we, if we fold this up, we're not quite done. We still need to do some work in here. But if I fold this up, I can concentrate better on this outside. So we've, we're now we're in, when you talk about being outside, that's like we're global. 
we're not inside a function, we're not inside a class definition. These things will just run when the page is loaded. So, so we're going to start with um, adding an event listener, adding a listener to the document object that will watch for DOM content loaded. So adding an event is just document dot add event listener and DOM content loaded loaded is a special event that gets fired when all of the all of the all of the HTML has been rendered so you're guaranteed that all of your buttons all of your anything you have on there to icons text everything is rendered because you don't want to like rush into running code that is going to like interact with your DOM before the DOM is fully loaded so this is a something provided for you for JavaScript to let you know that and if you've worked with jQuery and you've seen the ready function, that's the same thing. This just tells you that you're ready to start applying code to the DOM because it's fully loaded. So what's going to what we're going to do here is function event. And this is kind of something you may not have seen that we're we're passing in a function. We're passing a function like a variable. So we have this 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 function add event listener takes a string, which is the name of the of the of the event, and it takes the handler right here. So the handler doesn't have a name; it's an anonymous function. And I'm going to show you in ES6 the way that we can code these anonymous functions is with what's called arrow functions. So that's equivalent to saying I'll put that in there so you can have a look at that. If I'm going to comment that out to saying function function event. Okay, so event is the parameter, and this just this equal arrow points to this curly brace, which is where we're going to code the function. And they just kind of clean that up to make it easier um, to read and interpret. But inside the DOM content. We're going to, okay, so this is going to go uh, at the end, let's see. And it, you may not have seen this. Curly brace closes off this anonymous function, and the, this, you know, parentheses closes off the function call add listener. So you might want to stare at that a little bit to see how that works. And um, I just want to kind of introduce that to you because you're going to see that. Uh, that arrow function and wonder what that might be. So what do we do? First of all, we're going to get the start button element and save it as a variable called start button. So let start button equal document query selector. By the way, these document query selectors, they're just like jQuery, where you see dollar and you see a selector, document query selector is equivalent to that dollar, which that dollar is an alias for jQuery. So for those of you familiar with jQuery, this maps directly to vanilla JavaScript. So start button, hashtag start button, and then inside here we want to add a click event to the start button. So Again, we take our object and we add an event listener. So we know that button exists because we waited for DOM content loaded. So we can apply listeners and we can add a click event. And once again, I'm just going to use this arrow function. So I'm going to pass in a function and like every handler gets an event. So you're going to see that. And then in here, I'm going to create a new game. So remember, game was, is a global. I, I created it that very first step. And I'll call new on tic-tac-toe. And, and there it is. So this initiates the new game. And then the next thing, so this one goes with this. We created a new game. And then the next thing we're going to do is called start on the game. So let's go check out 
and that's just game.start. Um, and then note the end of the start listener is there. So that looks good. And we can actually put a semicolon there. We could put a semicolon there because that's actually an expression. And then the end of DOM content loaded goes there. So that is one of the things that we need to do that this will run, this will apply a listener when the when the, all everything's rendered, this will apply a listener to the start button that will create a new game and call start. Let's make sure we know what start's doing. So we haven't coded that yet. So let's go code, let's go take a look at coding that. So in start, we uh, a lot of times I might want to console log this. This gives me a good clue, like I'm bound to have bugs. Let's put a few of these console logs in because that'll tell us how far we got before we ran into a bug. First of all, the to do, we're going to call this dot setup board. And we coded that. That's going to paint our board on the screen. And so maybe I'll call console log setup board. That'll let me know that all that code worked because there was a lot in that setup board. And then the next thing I want to do is call this dot initialize move prompt. So initialize. We haven't coded that yet. That's a helper function. And console.log. I'm just adding these. These aren't required, but they help me to kind of see how far I got. So I'm kind of bubbling to the top of this. I, I want to see that all that helper code got run correctly. But we have we've done setup board, right? Um, there's setup board. And we haven't done initialized move prompt. So let's take a look at that. So this one initializes the move prompt element. So this one we show and hide because you don't want to show a move unless you've started the game. So this one uses some show and hide code. We can do that with a class that we've written that will hide that will um, hide. And we can go look at that class here. Let's see this dot start prompt set attribute. And this is start prompt. This is, is one of our uh, properties we initialize. So it's already set up. We can reference it with this hidden. Um, and then so the start prompt will be hidden and then the move prompt will be uh, set to nothing. So this will remove the hidden the hidden from the move prompt. And just to see what hidden is, let's go in here and it's display none. So it actually just sets a display none on that. And um, so we're kind of, we're going to hide the start prompt, but we're going to take the hidden off of the move prompt. And I think the move prompt starts out hidden. Let's see, move prompt. Yeah, so the move prompt starts out hidden because the, the game hasn't started. And then when we start it, we remove that hidden and then you see the move prompt. Then we are going to set the current player. So the current player is always player one. And this is something you might address in a stretch is maybe throw the dice, use a, a math.random to, to give the other player a chance to start first. But it's hard coded here that player one is initialized as the first player. And then this dot current player token set attribute. We're going to put the current player's token on that um, current player display. So again, we're going to use interpolation. A lot of mistakes are made at this point if you use you know quotes or or you know single quotes instead of the tick mark and you don't see your icon show up, it's usually just that it's not used the tick mark. So this is going to be uh, this dot current player token. Hopefully some of this naming is helping you to see what is actually going on in this code. All right.
So that initialized that move prompt. And we, and so that completes our start. So is there anything we haven't done? Let's review everything we've got here. We set up the game, we set up a player class, and then we saw a lot of work in this tic-tac-toe, so we sort of strategically addressed that. We've got all this initialized, the game state and the win states was given to us. We did the check for winner, we added uh, dispatching an event. Oh, I don't think we've handled our win events and draw events, so let's take a look at that. But we did do record move, switch player, Set up tile listeners. Yeah, so show win screen and show who calls for that. So this is back out in that in that to do area. So we're going to add in a listener. So we we did our DOM content. There's but there's more in this to do in this open area, this global area. One is we're going to add an event listener um, uh, for the win. So that is going to look like this. We don't have to wait for DOM content ready because this doesn't involve the DOM. This is a, a, a programmatic event that we created, this win event. So we just have to add a listener to win. This just says if anybody, if the event loop sends out any win events, I'm going to be the one to catch it. So let's try this event. And to do so we want we have uh, first thing in here is to show win screen so also in these I kind of like to put a, a log win event fired just so I know that that did get fired because that should get fired when the thing loads because it's out here in the global area and then I'm going to call game show win screen and we still need to code that. So look at that format. And then you can see this is the end of our win event listener. And now we're going to do the same thing for the draw event. So let's do document add event listener draw. And this has an event and console log draw event wired and game dot show draw screen yes um, so this is going in here and we'll format it so they're they're very similar you just I'm slogging the the event got fired and then I'm calling the screen that we want to show when you either win or draw. So let's go code those. So let's see. Uh, I think I must have made a mistake in there. Show win screen. There it is. Show win screen. So we want to We want to do a couple of things in here. We want to change the class attribute. So this dot windscreen dot set attribute. So the class will be set to show. And let's just quickly check what that means. Yeah, windscreen show and it just display block absolute. So it positions it up at the top. You can play around with this if you want. It's, you know, it kind of hides the screen and that's not good. Maybe you want to make it so it's not so, maybe not, not so, uh, take the opacity down or something. But that shows that pop up that you won. And then we also change the winner token because it, it shows the token in there token set attribute class oh wait this one is going to use our interpolation so fas fa dollar 
easy to make mistakes in this interpolation. They don't get caught very easily. So this is usually where a lot of debugging takes place. Okay. So we're going to set the, the token in that little win pop-up. And then we need to do something similar for the draw screen. So this dot a draw screen dot set attribute and class show. Okay, so it pops it up. There is no token in a draw, so we don't have to do anything there. So I think that's it. Let's go to the top and look. So we have our game, our player. Let's just fold these things up. We have our player. We have the constructor. We have check for winner. We got the record event, switch player, set up tile listeners, show win screen, show draw screen, set up board, initialize prompt, start. Okay, and then out here we have our DOM content loaded where we add a listener to the start button. Then we have our ad, our ad listeners for the win and the draw. And then we are ready to just let these run. So let's see if this works. All right, let's test this. So we're going to, oh, let's see, open with live server. And we're going to open up our inspector. And we're going to go look at source and JS main. Um, let's clear all these breakpoints out. Uh, see, I can just clear those quickly over here. Remove, remove all breakpoints. Okay, so um, we'll just refresh that. Click on Start Game, and uh oh, it it doesn't seem to have done anything because I would expect question marks. So I've got a bug in there, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to look. Uh, I'm going to start with the DOM content loaded because that's where I assign the listener for the start button. I'm going to put a breakpoint inside it and a breakpoint when it gets added. So it should get added on load, but then when I click on the start, it should come in here. So let's check that out. So here we are on load, you know, and this is asynchronous so that I'm, I'm loading it. I'm, I'm assigning the listener when I load the file. But I'm not, I shouldn't get into here until I click on here. But when I click on here, it should take me into this code that I put the listener on, and it's not happening. So I'm looking at this and I'm going, what is wrong? Ah, I think I see. I made a mistake in DOM content loaded. So let's look back here. Uh, so DOM content, content loaded. Okay, what did I do wrong? Oh, it's a typo. So if you see, that's got a capital for DOM, document object model, and I used a lowercase there. So that's probably my mistake. Let's grab that and put that there. This is just a comment, but we definitely need it there. Do we have any more cases in code? No. Okay, so we'll save that, go back and try this again. And we can just end that. So we'll reload that and start the game and it's still not firing. So let's take a look, go here. We did get in here this time. So now we want to do, uh, we're getting to the point where we're adding a click event. So that's good. We'll put a breakpoint in here to see if it starts up a new game. So we'll click on here. Ah, and it is creating a new game. So new tic-tac-toe. Then what happens in start? Well, let's look over in the console if there's any errors. No errors. Let's step into the start. And we'll step into setup board. I think I'll just step out and see if I got any error. Ah, we got an error there. Cannot set property. So game board is null. Okay, so let's take a look at that. All right, game board is null. So something went wrong when I initialized that game board. Let's go have a look at that code and see what it looks like. So here I'm at game board. 
Okay, I left off the hash. Darn. So let's let's and I see I left it off in a number of these. So let's just get that hash in there. So it told us to put that in there and I left it out. You probably saw me when I typed that, but there we are. Um, let's see if that fixes the problem. So we'll let this debugger go. And this, by the way, is a toggle on the debugger. So I can keep this open without having those breakpoints stop. Uh, stop it all up. Oh, there we go. But now I've got a problem. Cannot read token of undefined. So here we go. This dot current player. Okay, so this dot player one. Something went wrong in here. Let's just take a look at this and see where did we put current, where did we set up current player? Right there. So we're going to go add event listener. We can take these off. These are working now. And we click on that. Game. That works. Okay, current player is null. Player one undefined. Okay, so why is that? This dot player one should have gotten set up in our initialization. Let's go back to the code. This dot player when. Oh, sure enough, I skipped it to do. So I was supposed to set up player one and player two as um, as new. I was supposed to instantiate them with my chosen token. So I'm going to make player one at times, which looks like an X, and this dot player to new player circle. Okay, so let's try that now and see what happens. So we'll let the debugger go and we'll start game. And once again, we have another error. I think it looks like we're not creating all of our rows and columns. So let's take a look at that. So I'll go back and look at this uh, setup, the setup board. And what do you know? I'm, I've, I made a typo in the inner loop. So that should be J and that should be J. So typos will get you every time. Let's give that a try now. And start game. Okay, great. We got all of our board, all our question marks. Let's try a game. Uh-oh, it's not recording those guys. And it's not setting this. So we'll inspect. And so whenever you get into big chunks of code like this, you are going to have some errors. So we reviewed move one, reviewed move six. But something didn't happen there. So let's take a look. All right, so it appears that there's a problem. Now it's changing the, the icon to zero, but when I click on that, it's not setting that to zero. So I think there's a problem in this record move event. So I'm gonna put a breakpoint there, restart this, and I can see that when I go in here, um, it's testing X and Y, and that looks good. And then it's setting that. But I think I've seen the problem when I when I go to zero now and I record move. Okay, so I step in there. And what's happening is it look at my game state. I used to have three three items in the array here, like I do here, but I actually set it to one. So when I did that setting, I should have just set one element of that inner array, but I actually wiped it out with a string. So if I look a little closer, I can see I used a comma instead of an array in here. So I wiped out that whole row of, of the game state with a single icon. So let's fix that. I can see where that is now. And so that's in the record move. And this should be like this. So this is saying game state and then row column, basically. So let's try that now. So we start the game. Okay, let's undo the debugger. 
And then we'll come over here. Yay, that one's set. And now it says X is move. Okay, Y is move. And we'll set X is move. And he won. And we got our pop-up for win. So let's see if we can get a stalemate to go. So we start the game. And we X. Sometimes it's hard to lose. But... There are no more moves, so we got our draw. All right, so it looks good. So let's consider the testing done. And I suggest doing more testing, but for right now, we'll consider that done. And we'll check this in. So git status, git add, git commit, um, code update, git push. All right, that looks good. And it's too bad we had to wait so long to figure it out, but it's it's kind of, there's a lot of code here. I mean, and you'll see when we get into working with uh, next quarter with, with the uh, frameworks that we can make this more modular, and then we aren't dealing with this much code. So let's see, we're at our browser game. We should have this checked in, yeah, 34 seconds ago. We'll go to settings. And we will set up our GH pages. And because I'm using DNS, I will enforce HTTP. And then we'll just wait for that to publish. So that is our tic-tac-toe game. And I think there's a lot of great examples of working with uh, arrays um, or with events, adding event listeners, adding events, and um, I, it's a lot of code. And let's just, I'll take a moment right now at the end to just go back and, and just kind of scroll through this, give you a good look at it, because we didn't do it in order because we wanted to kind of follow more the play of the game than the order of the code. But we got our game, global game variable, we set up our player, we did a constructor for tic-tac-toe where we set up players and we initialized a whole bunch of properties. Um, some of them just state values that help us keep track of our game. And then others, we created uh, DOM element objects that we could use so that we could change the view of the game. Um, we looked at game state. We saw what it looks like if you make a mistake and wipe out a row with a string. We didn't have to do too much with win states because we weren't doing that, but you, we, this was coded for us, but um, you can take a look at how that works. We set up a, a win event. We set up a draw event. So we created our own events and, and fired them off with the dispatch event. We created some re record move code, so we found out the X and Y position. We tested if it had already been filled in before we set the current token on it and set it as played. We created a switch player, so we toggled that, and then we set the class uh, for the, for, to, so that the little icon to the left would show the current token. Um, we set up our tile elements and added click events and sent them to handle move, which is at the bottom and was, re as was uh, coded for us. We have a show win screen and a show draw screen. So those just basically hide and show that little area that tells us if we've done anything. And remember, the button on that really is just taking us home. It's just an anchor tag that takes us home. We didn't have to code any kind of event handler for that button. Set up board, we saw a nested loop where we did rows and columns and we appended uh, spans to divs and then uh, which represented the tiles and then divs to the column div and then we um, appended the columns to the rows and then we appended the rows to the game board. So we were able to dynamically build that HTML content um, from our code. And then we set up tile listeners. We initialized the move prompt so that you know you when you when it was time to switch players. Um, well, oh wait, this is the we um, we 
we could um, indicate who the player was. And we remember we said it was the default player was player one, but that might be something you could set up a math.random so that it could be player one or player two. And then we made their the current token uh, player token have the current player's assigned token. And then start, we just did some console logging. We set up the board and initialized the move prompt. So that was where it tells says go ahead and move. Then we we have something to add uh, for DOM content loaded. We dealt with the start button. So as soon as that button was rendered, we could attach a click event to it that would instantiate the game and start it. And then we dealt with our programmatic events win and draw by just uh, showing the appropriate screen, which is what we initialized in the constructor for tic-tac-toe. And then this handle move event was given to us. So a lot of code to understand, but the debugger can really be your friend in this and um, a great exercise and uh, good introduction to working with events and the JavaScript event loop.